everybody. Welcome back to the Creative Gap Podcast. Um, Obviously, we're not in my normal scene. We're doing a live podcast today, and I'm very excited about it. It's my first one ever, and it's with a very special guest, uh, Mr. Edward Lee. Um, The reason why we're doing a live podcast is because Musicbed sent us to Texas. Uh, We're at their lake house in Fort Worth, and we thought it'd be a great opportunity to do a podcast, and with who better than Ed right here. Um, Ed is a, an amazing filmmaker, photographer, creative, YouTuber, podcaster. Uh, this man does it all, and I'm super excited to chat with him today. So thanks for coming on. Yo, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. I know my, my title's kind of long. There's a lot of things in there, but I'm excited. To, I'm honored, honestly, to be the first in person with these camera angles. So if you guys are watching on video, hopefully it looks good. I hope it looks good. Because even though it doesn't look like it, we just spent the last 30 minutes setting this up. And I think part of the reason why it took 30 minutes is because it took 30 minutes to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> it's the longest <laughs> to, to take, make a cup of coffee ever. Um, but yeah, man, I'm excited to have you on as the first live guest. Yes. Um, Thank you for having me. Right on. Um, the one thing I really want to ask you is when you decided to go full-time YouTube, because that's something that, um, not that I've necessarily contemplated, but... I've always tried to figure out when that time is for somebody. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's funny because, like, you mentioned, I feel like in the creative industry, becoming, like, a full-time YouTuber is kind of like an accolade. Like, it's right. it's it's getting to, like, the pinnacle, right? Like, you do YouTube full-time. So, like, part of last year, um, end of 2022, like, the second half, I was like, you know what? I'm going to say no to all my client work, and then I'm going to just, like, double down and go hard on YouTube. So I was pumping out, like, one video a week getting brand deals and it was like the full youtuber thing and then at the end of 2022 i found myself in a very like burnt out Mm -hmm. position where it wasn't as sexy as i thought it was going to be becoming a full-time youtuber got to a point where i had like an editor helping me had someone helping me shoot and like i still work with those boys and they're awesome but there was a lot of like mental battle when when i was like trying to be the youtuber side so now like in 2023 currently I've kind of gone back. I've retracted that and I've been doing a lot more client work um, and also YouTube. So now I feel like it's good for me to have like a healthy split between what I do professionally, which is, you know, high quality photo video content for brands like on a that's you internally used internally. And then also my personal brand, which is like YouTube, Instagram, all the things. Um, So, yeah, that's that's a little bit about the brief beginning of me trying to go full-time on youtube right i think something too i've i've heard from somebody that said maybe it was like five six seven years ago people had aspirations to become like the full-time youtuber and that be their like source of income their job but i feel like a lot of people now use youtube as like a catalyst to essentially catapult them to other directions like use brands to um, create their own projects and Mm. not necessarily just be a full-time youtuber but branch off into other avenues as well yeah how have you seen maybe that benefit you in some way well i mean it's a really good point you bring that up because i feel like as you said every big creator eventually wants to start something of their own exactly like we've seen it happen with um obviously like the big big youtubers anyone who watches any big youtuber they eventually start their own product start their own line even even celebrities i mean it happens at the high level even celebrities right like when they get to a certain level like let's say they're tired of acting or they're tired of doing their professional skill they come out with like a makeup brand Mm. or they come out with like their own tequila or their own whiskey you know like those are the same things that happen on a micro level in the youtube space like some of these creators are tired of working with like brands, you don't have to like name specific ones, but they just wanted to start their own thing. This is where I think though, there's a bit of like a paradox Mm -hmm. because um, in order to get to that point, you need capital, obviously. You need to grow a channel, right? right? So think for a second, every person who's starting out on social media in general, posting their work online, everyone's an underdog, right? In the beginning, only your friends and family are following you and they're like rooting hard for you, right? Everyone starts there. And then... You would hope so. Yeah, right? (laughs) Yeah, hopefully you don't have like everyone just dogging on you from the very start, like all your friends and your family. (laughs) Like stop posting. Um, But I feel like everyone starts there and then as you grow, let's say you hit like something pops off. Either you're part of a project or a post you that goes semi-viral. Everyone experiences something that performs much better than everything else that they've done ever before Mm -hmm. like everyone has that those kind of high points Mm -hmm. 
Um, so once you ride that, the natural progression is you get brands to reach out to you. And when brands reach out to you, you get sponsored deals, you get brand deals, and you start making money off of your following. But this is the paradox because you start to like you started by getting like giving your audience what they wanted first but as you get brand deals to become a more quote-unquote successful creator the audience now feels more detached from you right. because you're not that like super relatable guy anymore you're like getting brand deals flying here flying yeah. here so it's you're like you're just trying to sell things exactly all the time. so in the end it's like this paradox because what you're working towards is actually not what your audience wants right. you to work towards but it's necessary to get to the next step, which is having your own brand. Right. And then in that case, too, I think there's something like if, if you're not doing YouTube full time, but you also have other streams of income. Like for me, for example, DPing is primarily how I make my living. So I'm able to say no to certain brand deals if I don't feel connected to them, if I don't resonate with them or if I don't think it's going to truly benefit my audience. But if you're doing YouTube full time, like if that is the only thing that you're doing and you're relying solely on the money aspect of brands, I feel like it's a really difficult position to be in to say no or yes. But having in another stream of income, like if you're a graphic designer, doing things freelance maybe, I think is a great opportunity to essentially separate yourself a little bit from the YouTube side. 100%. And I think I think it takes a bit of like, um, like experience right. to arrive to that destination. Like what you just said on the mic, a lot of creatives don't hit that till like, many seasons of burnout or just like mm -hmm. feeling feel like they don't haven't figured it out yet like they don't come to that conclusion early at least i didn't either um and it's really important that you have that kind of safe space for yourself because the very and there, i understand why a lot of people don't get into the social media space now because before when i was younger when i was first starting out that content i was like oh my god that'd be so cool right. who doesn't want 100,000 followers who doesn't want a million subscribers and like traveling around the world shooting content working with all these cool brands like sounds super awesome but no one talks really about the mental side like in the mental toll that it can take on you because like you're a dp i do some um work on set and what's so nice about it is like you're just being you like, you're not carrying this persona. Like, no one cares in the room if you have 100,000 followers. No one even cares if you have an Instagram. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, we all know that DP that, like, you, you go to their Instagram and it's, like, one photo of their dog. And they're usually they're the absolutely, best. like, nasty <laughs> on set. Like, they're just so yeah. freaking good. Like, so talented. Like, shooting right. movies out here. And that's just an testament to, like, what I'm saying. Like, they're, you don't always have to be, like on social to be successful at your job and i think a lot of creators forget that because mm -hmm. when we say the word creative it kind of goes without saying like oh they're probably on social they probably have a social following but you can be creative and like not even be on social media right that's interesting you don't yeah. have to have like a following you don't have to show up online and then actually i encourage people to start seeking out like what actually fulfills you as a creative without the numbers attached there's a podcast i recently did um uh, with a guy named Andy, and we talked about this thing that I, it kind of hit me like a bus. I was like, if there was no chance of going, like everyone who creates content right now online, if there was no chance of going viral, like let's say that just like wasn't a thing, mm. like you don't go viral, like things don't blow up, and posting reels, posting podcasts, doing anything online was purely out of enjoyment, how many people would actually wake up and do that every single day? Interesting. Probably not a lot. Because everyone does this because there's like a bit of an end goal destination, right. whether that's right. monetary, whether that's a network, whatever. Whereas that's, that's, that's why I'm saying like you can get kind of blurry mm -hmm. at times within like what you really love doing, your craft, and then also like what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So having that, like you said, going back to your point, that separate stream of revenue yeah. is very healthy because now you don't have to rely so heavily on YouTube or brand deals or social media etc yeah exactly and what you were saying about you know being a creative and having socials i think something that you, i forget a lot too is that you can create something and not put it on social media just create it for the sake of creating and not share it with the world 100%. Um, and i feel like i've i have a bunch of things that i like, have on my hard drive that will never see the light of day but in the moment it helped me get out of like a moment of anxiety that I had maybe and I was just like sitting there I didn't know what to do so I just like created something 
I didn't need to put it out, but it helped me get out of that funk in that particular time of day mm. or in that moment. Yeah. And I think that really helps me. And I think, I think it could help a lot of people too is because we all deal with anxiety of some sort. And for me, creating something, whether it's big or small, or if I'm just practicing some lighting thing or learning something new about a camera, whatever it is, that immediately will help me refocus and get out of that mindset of like depression or anxiety mm -hmm. and not sharing it is also a great way to just keep it for yourself. Uh, I think that's a something that a lot of people don't think about often. Yeah, no, it's true. Like a lot of times creating for yourself and not posting it out into the world is like, like again, creating that safe space for yourself yeah. to um, figure out what you're going through and why you feel like everyone has that a bit of that blocker. Sometimes you wake up and you're like, there's just, there's just that invisible friction that you feel and you just yeah. don't know what it is. And sometimes you just need to do you. The invisible friction that you're feeling is you're just trying to show up for all these people except yourself. And if you can just do something for yourself, you might be able to remove that mm. blocker that's holding you back. And it's also, like I said, because creatives in general or even professional space on set, a lot of people now, it's like they don't want to work on something unless they want to like have it be something they're proud of they could post on social exactly like they don't want to work on a project unless they can put like a full crew in the description and tag mm -hmm. everyone and like make it this whole ordeal mm -hmm. right because if you don't do that then you're like not making it right. quote unquote and that's a hard thing too like what you're saying with the balance because there's part of that that does help your business side mm -hmm. though for sure so it's balancing the business of oh, i need to i want to share this big set that i'm working on or share this cool project because it, it might lead to that next project or the next bigger one but, that, but at the same time, personally, I'm like, I really don't want to share this. But it's the balance between business and personal. I think that's tricky. Yeah. And we talked about it a little bit yesterday off the mic. You mentioned something really good, which is a lot of people don't. Um, there's a lot of things that we don't see on social media. Like some of these people who are, you know, DPs or they're producers or like people who are big on big sets. They probably work like odd jobs, too. Every person who's a freelancer always has a season of odd jobs. That's just how it goes. Yeah but they're not posting that work mm -hmm. on their social because they know what who they're trying to be. They know the kind of brand image they want to craft of themselves. And this is where you kind of need some business knowledge, right? Stuff like whoever's listening to this podcast right now, if you don't know this, this is kind of the area where you would learn, like the space that you would learn stuff like this because no one's, <laughs> it's not fun to talk about like on social media. Yeah. But yeah, really creating that brand for yourself is important because then it will lead you to some of the dream projects or dream clients that you want. I see sometimes people just posting anything and everything and that's where it can get muddy. Mm -hmm. Like if you're not focused on brand and you're just posting like your dog photos, you're posting like that one mom and pop shop gig you <laughs> yeah. did. Then you're posting like some fire 20 person set, like right. narrative short film that you shot with someone like on your Instagram too. And it's all over the board. It, it's hard for any one, any brand to fit, see how they fit into your brand mm -hmm. and then how any other audience people who find your profile how they can resonate with you because you're just kind of all over the board right. um so that's really crucial what you said mm. and i think that particular type of person could also benefit from we can i think it's fine we're, we're at a lake house guys and yeah, there's like fine. people walking around and stuff, okay. so they might have some just deal with sounds. it yeah um but i think there's also like that balance i think we mentioned it earlier like that 40 year old dp that has an instagram just because yeah or the, the director, the production designer, or someone that's like in the traditional space, for example, they don't care about Instagram. They don't care about certain things. And I think that brings it back to the point that you're saying is social media really isn't everything to certain people. Um, but yeah, for a lot of us, especially younger creatives, we feel that social media is what is kind of our business. Mm. In a way. Yeah, and it and it is like times are changing. Right, like times are different from like yeah, like that forty year old DP back in the back in the day. Times are definitely different, and I think we're we're adapting with that. And I think especially our generation uh, over the last five ten years, like we've seen some crazy advancements in social media space. Like there's been social media around for decades now, in many different forms, but I would say like over the last ten years is when you started to see people making like full-blown successful careers right. off of just posting online. And that's like a new concept still. You know what I mean? Like you meet these creators who are making literally seven figures posting YouTube videos. Yeah. Like 
10 years ago, you tell your mom and dad, I'm going to be a YouTuber and make millions of dollars. It's like, that's not a thing. Isn't it the number one, like, most sought? Most sought yeah. yeah. Or influencer. I think or influencer. <laughs> oh, God. Our generation is doomed. It's so bad. Because that's the other thing, too. Is like, you said it before. I, I, everyone aspires to be, like, an influencer or a YouTuber, but no one really understands what it takes to do that. Yeah. It's and also, it, it's it's so, it you really, it's, like, kind of hard because... You need to have enough self-awareness right. to like remove yourself from what you're currently doing. And that's hard. Mm. Um, this is with anything in life. Honestly, it's more like philosoph- philosophical, but like even in your work, day-to-day job, like if you get so consumed in your day job and you don't take a step, like a t- step back to look at your life from like a bird's eye perspective, it's so easy to get caught up in that. Yeah. And it's the same thing with creative work. If you don't know how to like take a bird's eye view, like I sometimes have to remind myself like, oh yeah, like I'm a normal person in the burbs. I have family, I have parents, I have married, I have a dog. Like I don't need to be constantly living this like crazy life. Like it's okay to be in the slow moment. Not not identifying yourself as a content creator, filmmaker, YouTuber. Because I'll meet, like, the, one of the most humbling things, dude, is, like, you have these conversations with creatives, like, you know, what are you doing with this brand deal? How are you right. doing this? And then you just, like, uh, my mom and dad own a sandwich shop in, um, near where we are. And we'll get cu- hundreds of customers coming every day, right? And we live in, like, they work in the financial district of this, like, area called Tacoma. I don't know how many people watch or, like, mm-hmm. familiar with Washington, but um, they're in Tacoma. You meet, I met this one guy, and he's, like, the most low-key billionaire. And you just wouldn't even know. Yeah. Like, he's not on social. He just worked hard. He loves spending time with his family. You're talking to him, and he's like, he just worked hard, and now he's a billionaire. He doesn't even care if he has, like, an Instagram post or not. And it's so humbling because you meet these people that are like, yeah, they're not famous. They're not on, like, billboards and stuff, but they're just living a happy life. And that really has always shifted my perspective of meeting people like that. It's, wow, I don't need massive recognition to feel fulfilled mm. i think when you like let that go you can really become the true authentic version of yourself which ironically sometimes when that happens you then become like that re- recognized individual so like yeah it yeah it's kind of weird how that happens but i think the first step is realizing it's not necessary and just being who you are right how long do you think it took for you to like make that realization or make the shift on your channel instead of being or trying to you know promote this persona that truly wasn't you Mm. into something that is more you yeah i mean i think that's a constantly a work in progress yeah i think that's a great answer i feel the same exact way like i don't think there's ever been a point in my career i'm like dude i got it all figured out this is who i am this is what i'm doing yeah you evolve as a human yeah if you stay stagnant as a human obviously your youtube or whatever is going to stay the same but as you evolve you get married you have kids you grow older you indefinitely are going to evolve as a human which i think is going to correlate to mm-hmm. your youtube and how you perceive yourself exactly and i think that's okay um because some people are super hyper fixated on like what's my niche what's my title sometimes everything down from like the way they dress the way they talk they want to fit this kind right. of personality and that's that's not even just social media that's people in general right um and so I think for me personally, over the last, because I've honestly been shooting with a camera and just like doing creative stuff for probably like over 10 years now, um, I would say it's a work in progress. Like it's never like, oh, I got to figure it out. But I will say I've always tried to figure out what feels authentic to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess to dive a little bit deeper in the work in progress statement, yeah. I'm always asking myself like, does this feel like authentic to what I'm doing? Or does it feel like I'm acting, like we talked about a couple minutes ago, like in the best interest of what the brands want, what this mold that I need to like fill. Um, that's where I need to like have enough self-awareness to take a step away from my content. Be like, okay, now this isn't me. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not going to do this. Um, and so I'm constantly checking myself. Right. And that's hard. Like some people don't do that. And then they lose themselves in the process. Um, I've seen it happen to some big creators and, that's always a tough thing to watch when you see someone just kind of like go, go like ditch their authentic self to kind of ride the wave. And everyone has their own way of getting to the top or whatever, so to speak. But for me, I'd rather just be slow about it mm-hmm. and do it in a way where I can look back on all my years and be like, wow, that was like, I really put my best foot forward 
on trying to be the best version of myself right. and not like, oh yeah, I caught this one little thing and I wrote it and milked it super hard yeah. to get to this point and then to kind of repivot, you know? So everyone has their own way of doing things. And I think to go along with, you know, trying to find your authentic, authentic self be the best version of you for your audience i think that comes along with the amount of posting that you do and the quality of the posting consistency i come from the mentality of oh i need to post every monday be consistent and i think that came from when i first started it was beginning of covid i set a goal for myself that every monday for the entire year put something up every single monday mm -hmm. on youtube and I think that helped me it kind of kickstart the YouTube and what I wanted to do. Um, but now I find that it may be more beneficial to me to maybe do twice a month instead of four times a month or once a month to improve the quality more so than the consistency of it and maybe lack the quality. Um, do you feel do you feel that the, the less consistent in the sense of like once a month or once every so often, but the quality of your video? is significantly better, is better for you at this moment? Or did you also think that I need to post every single Monday or every single Tuesday, whatever it was? Yeah, that's a good question. That's awesome. It's, it's like I'm sort of reflecting. I'm reflecting on your question a bit. I think for me personally, I really try to have high quality in my work. And like yourself, that's how you are too. And I guess... I'd rather prioritize the quality than the consistency aspect mm. to answer your question. Um, I've tried to go down the consistency route too, but then it starts to just feel really stale. Like it starts yeah. to feel like a job, which then brings you back to the question, if this just feels like a job, why am I pursuing this? If like right. it doesn't fulfill me. Um, so I think everyone kind of has to ask himself the question, when you get into YouTube, when you get into anything, when you get into trying to become a DP, when you try to you know, make films, what is what are you trying to do yeah <laughs> right are, are you trying to like make it your career so you can just like have a healthy comfortable financial cushion or are you doing this because it like makes you feel like super creatively fulfilled right. and sometimes those two those two aspects are not always in harmony mm. they're actually quite in conflict often you know making money and then doing what fulfills you yeah. they're usually in conflict with each other that's the whole reason why sometimes people are bootstrapping films people are just like taking money out of their own pocket to work on the projects they want to work on. It's because, again, the money, making money part and doing what you love is not in harmony there, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. in a perfect world, brands are paying you, business are paying you tons of money right. to do the exact projects that you want to do, right? But that's not the world we live in. Right. Um, some people have gone to that point, but a lot for a lot of us listening, like we're still very much so in that figure out phase of like, okay, how do we work, find that balance between what we love and then what we can do to like provide for our families, and like provide for ourselves, like it's a hard balance. Um, I will say back to the consistency thing for me though, I've realized I work so much better when my back is against the wall, which mm. I hate. I hate about. That's interesting. I hate you about said something like I think it was the first day we were here. Yeah. You upload the day of or like the, right before you're about to post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like. I hate that about myself. I don't know where it, where it started or why, but I'm very much so a deadline person. Okay. I've learned that the last two years. Like when I have deadlines, I work better. Uh, if I just if you give me a lot of time, I'm going to fill that time. Mm. Versus if you say like, okay, we need this like in a month, or like the week of, like we need this next week, I'll very much so do it mm. in that we can figure it out. Uh, I'm not the type of person. There's two types of people, right? Like there's people who when the time is like crunching and they need to like really get stuff going, they shut off, shut down a bit, get paralyzed and then drop the ball, which happens sometimes. But for me, I work so much better when my back is against the wall and I need to find solutions. Like I feel like I'm a good problem solver. I think that's the name of the game for any creative yeah. filmmaker is that's your job is being a problem solver. Yeah, exactly. And so when I get into that problem solver mode, I think is, when my, some of my best work yeah. comes out, which sucks because it's stressful sometimes being in that problem solver mode. But I also realized, uh, call it creative flow, call it like right. flow state or whatever that that mindset is, you need to find what works for you. Some people are really good at going on set. If you're editing and shooting, let's say, for example, some people are really good at coming home with that footage, 
dumping it and literally hopping into a timeline that night yeah just to like yeah, orga- yeah. organize their footage or f- figure out how do they can like, write off that inspiration some people are like me where i come home dump the footage and i will not open that timeline for like mm. two weeks which is like a bad thing for me okay. i don't like that i do that but sometimes you know you just have to figure out what works for you do you feel like you need the disconnect sometimes between you shooting a project and you editing it do you think that space even though you say you, you hate it do you think it gives you a new perspective on the footage by waiting um instead of being like so emotionally attached to it like let me let me go a little deeper hmm. sometimes that when i shoot something i love a shot so much because of the way it looks or whatever but it might not be the right thing in the edit but i'm so emotionally attached to the way it looks it's hard for me to get rid of it but if i separate it or if there's a, obviously a different editor they're not emotionally attached to it anymore do you hmm. feel that that two weeks might give you that separation yeah sometimes definitely i know what you're saying sometimes it does for me but i've always been of the camp where i learned something in my very first job this is where i learned to edit my boss <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of a story back in story to your point when i first learned how to edit it was in premiere mm. and i got hired at this company called rhino camera gear i'm not sure if anyone knows like they make motorized sliders okay. um but i was working there as an uh, editor content creator, photographer, I wear all the hats. I specifically hit an edit. My very first edit that I made for the company, it was like a YouTube video. Um, my boss came to look at it over my shoulder. Oh no. Yeah, I'm like new, I'm like pretty green right now with like Premiere at this point, right? But I, I thought in my head like, this is a banger edit, like this is fire. <laughs> I was like, this is so fire. I'm like, put me in coach, comes over my shoulder, looks at it. And like literally, he was like, "This is a drag. Like it feels so long." And he's like, "This is is not that great." And that was like, as an editor, everyone who edits knows that like, it's always nerve wracking when someone's watching your edit in front of you, like over your shoulder. Like what you thought felt fast now feels like it's taking a minute to watch that like two frames. Um, and my point in saying that is, he said this one thing to me that I'll never forget. He said, "You have to be ready to like." <laughs> oh no so like kind of dark <laughs> kill your like babies oh, in the timelines yeah, yeah. like in your timeline um like you can't baby your clip sometimes right and i think you need to be totally okay as a creative to be able to take that step back and look at the overall project like what feels right pacing what feels right with music and just because a shot looks good if it doesn't add to the overall objective or your mission it's taking away you gotta take it out yeah um this is something I learned with YouTube specifically because the attention span of people are so short these days. I'm constantly watching my videos and dissecting them through the lens of like a viewer. I'm not necessarily like dissecting them as me, Ed, creating it. Like how am I being perceived? I always watch it like, okay, if I was a viewer. Could I sit through this? Could I sit through this? And if I I have this gauge for myself when I'm editing a video of, if I feel even the slightest bit like this is kind of boring, like this part here mm-hmm. feels a little like dull. Someone else is probably feeling. Someone's that. probably like, yeah, yeah this sucks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's elevated because again, those are your babies. Like even my talking headshots. I mean, you can probably relate to this. And yeah. anyone who is like in the filmmaking space, like I tweak those talking head bits so much. Like I'm trying to get the lighting right. right. I'm trying to get like everything like the hair light i'm trying to get the diffusion all soft but to the average viewer like no one cares about that kind of stuff like yeah they might be like oh this is a clean talking head but no one knows that you were in your room without camera speeding for like two hours trying to tweak right. small things like get the shotgun mic like mm. just right out of frame or whatever right and so those are all the things that no one sees but yeah you need to be able to be ready to detach yourself to go back to your question to detach yourself from some of your what you deem as your best work because that's just your opinion and you need to be vulnerable and be ready, ready to have other pe- other people judge your work yeah. and that's hard that's super hard but that's growth mm. <laughs> if you want to grow as a creative you need to be ready for people to give you that constructive criticism because if you're one of those people who like are not open to constructive constructive criticism <clears throat> i think it'll be really hard for you to grow right. in any industry not just youtube it's like on set production work launching your own brand anything you need to be ready for like that cc is what i call it yeah that your boss at that moment in that job um that's definitely at that moment wasn't easy to hear 
Dude, I like was crying after that, honestly. No, I wasn't actually crying, but I felt like I wanted to cry. Right? No, I feel that. And I think obviously you realize afterwards how impactful that was for you. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have mentor like other mentors in this industry? Like whether it's YouTube or just content or, you know, web design, photography that have also helped you and I guess like how important is it to have somebody to look up to and ask questions about things that you're feeling. Um, cause for me, it's helped tremendously just be able to express myself to something, to someone that's been through it that can walk me through their experience. Yeah. Um, I've had a few mentors along the way for sure. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily one of those very clean cut. Hey, do you want to be my mentor? Right, right. I'm your mentee. Let's, right, right. can we create a mastermind? It wasn't necessarily something like that, but I've definitely had, high points of people I've looked up to and asked a bunch of questions, learned a ton from. Um, but I've kind of always taken the, and you kind of strike me as the same type where I've always taken the student approach to everything. Yeah. Like even this podcast and us talking, like I'm learning from this mm-hmm. in certain ways. I'm getting value and learning from your experience and hopping on the mic. And I'm always kind of looking where can I like find value and add more to either the community I'm in or add more to myself or add more to like, how can I give back to this person I'm talking to? Because yeah, like, from my experience, those are the high points of when I have climbed the most growth. The times where I feel stagnant is when I'm out of that student mentality and I think I know everything. Right. Or I think I, I no one can teach me on my brand better than I know about mm-hmm. my brand. Like that's when it can be really easy to not grow or if you do grow it's like super slow and like it's almost flatlining but when you meet new people when you surround yourself with people who are better than you i mean it's like so powerful like this experience that we're at yeah literally people from all over the world Mm -hmm. different parts of the country and uh, yeah i mean for me i come from a space that's super traditional Mm -hmm. so seeing you guys work that's like you're always, you have your cameras out, you're shooting. It's so new to me, this type of working. And it's, it's inspiring to see the amount of work that you guys put in that people don't see regularly. Um, But just talking at night with everybody and hearing everyone's perspective, you just learn so much and Mm -hmm. it's truly just invaluable. Yeah. It's, it's seriously important who you surround yourself with. Um, And just understanding that, (laughs) I think something I always remind remind myself of is everyone's figuring it out. <laughs> yeah. As much as yeah. people want to like, yeah, conf- having confidence is one thing. Like some people definitely have more confidence than others and that's a personality trait. But as far as like life and as a general topic, everyone is just trying to figure it out, right? right? That's just like the mission that everyone is on. And I think when you you can find comfort in that, Right. Knowing that if you're if you're listening to this right now and you're thinking, dang, I don't really have it all figured out yet. I'm still trying to figure out what my brand is, what I want to do, etc. That's okay. And when you lean into the fact that that's okay, you can you're getting closer to acting like to your true self right. and what you're going to be good at. If you keep looking at everyone like, man, why does everyone have it figured out except me? That mentality will catch it will trip you up. I am definitely guilty of that too. Yeah, same. I think we same. all are. I, I, I try dealing with that so often because, yeah, you're on social media. You see all the positives all the of every. Projects. You see all that cool stuff, and you're like, "Why am I not doing this cool <laughs> stuff?" But I think we forget to realize that we are also doing cool stuff. Like, I think about this too: is when I'm not busy and I'm I'm looking on social media, and I see people working on set, and I see all these, and it, it makes me slightly envious of that. I think when I'm busy and I'm posting stuff on set, there are also people that are looking at me being like, oh, I'm envious of that. So it's like this, it's this never ending cycle that happens, but it's important to, for me, I think I'm, I delete social media pretty often, especially like like, off your phone, like you'll you'll just get rid of it entirely. Dang. Um, Because I found it's better for me to just like detach myself entirely Mm. and it allows me to just be more present when I'm not say busy or if I'm feeling anxious about something Um, because social media sometimes is bad for me but it's also some of the it's the best thing for me too yeah it's it is like a it's a double-edged sword for sure Um, 
So I, yeah, it's tough. But for the for like what you were saying, you're no one's alone in that. Yeah, everyone's growing, everyone's learning, but it's important to be vulnerable and be open and talk to people about things like mm-hmm. that. It's very easy to look back at your low points. Um, it's not often people are grateful and find gratitude in their high points. Yeah. We put more weight. Yeah. In the points. Yeah. It, it's like, it's no different. There's like the statistic. What is it? There are people saying like, it takes like, like one negative comment. takes, it takes like 10 positive comments or something like right, that right. to overcome like one negative comment. Like that one ne- negative comment could like totally ruin your ego or whatever. It's the same thing with our creative industry. Like it's so easy to uh, push away or not reflect on some of the cool stuff we worked on. Mm-hmm. And think about where we all the things we still have to accomplish. Because right. ten years ago, if you told me that I'd be where I am today, I'd be stoked. Right. I'd be like over the moon. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you told me we'd be here at this lake house talking to other creatives and doing this cool stuff, or being on a podcast right. like this, and being able to even have the privilege to talk about what we're talking about, right. um, it's something that you really need to take a moment to pause and think about sometimes. And you say ten years. And you could also look at it as like last year. Yeah. You You're last like, year, looking at where you are today, mm-hmm. you would be stoked at where you are today. Mm-hmm. At least I'd, I'd hope so. And for, for me, that's, I think I look at it like that. It's it's funny because <laughs> I feel like we're in a bit of a, for me, I have these um, like out of body experiences. And I'm thinking to myself, like, dang, I became the villain that I never thought I'd be called. <laughs> like, it's so funny because. I love everything we're doing on this trip. And just to give a little context, like it's awesome. Like yesterday we went to go rip around some exotic cars and I love that because it was such a cool experience for everyone right. here. And I've always wanted to drive those types of things. <laughs> like subconsciously in the back of my head too. I'm like, if, if the person like I was two years ago told me that we'd be here doing this, I'd be like, dang, that doesn't make any sense. That's not aligning with like what I want, but that's how you're saying early on the mic we're always evolving yeah. and being constantly in that mode and being acceptant to the things that happen in life and just changing with the times is crucial you don't want to be like stuck in your ways if you're stuck in your ways then you won't grow and i think being open to new experiences being open to new people mm-hmm. never writing someone off because they don't have the same following as you like right. is super important right. just when you meet people be be like a human about it and get to connect with others and you'll be surprised at the amount of growth you can have in a very short period. If you're open to life and what comes with all the things, ups, highs, and lows, within one, two, three, four years, you will literally, your life will look entirely different mm. versus if you just say, this is my thing, this is how I am, these are the type of people I want to be with, these are the type of experiences I want to have, and you put yourself in this box, your growth curve will be a lot less mm exponential it, that's just my opinion oh, I, not I, everyone but yeah no 100%. that's my has been my experience I also i think to go along with being open to people i think there's also an element of cutting people off yeah right yeah and i, I don't think that's talked about too a lot is maybe it's you know maybe not creatives or whatever but there are certain people in your life that are holding you back potentially whether it's friends from high school middle school or childhood they just don't align with who you are, who you want to become. And that's a hard thing too, is letting go of certain people that are kind of looking at you and you are treating yourself like your old self around them. I think that's really important as well. Yeah, that's huge. I think you brought out something that a lot of successful people don't talk about. Everyone that I know that is in that flow state where it just seems like they can't trip up, something like they're, the momentum is on their side. They're just crushing it they've all been through like a shave down phase of their time and their energy, which, you know, cutting off people kind of goes into that basket. But anybody, anybody who's trying to accomplish something knows that there's a season of life where you just need to shed off what's taking your time and your energy. And sometimes, yeah, it's the people you spend your time with. It's the hobbies you have, like hobbies could totally consume your life too. And there's a healthy balance between it all. And it's super cliche, but you are the result of the five closest friends you have. Right. It's something that I've heard many, many times. We all have heard it, and sometimes we're almost in denial to believe it because we're like, even though, uh, even though the friends I spend time with on the weekends like do this, that's not me. I'm on my thing. Right. But 
this it's hard it's just not how it is because the opposite is true when you surround yourself with five people who are better than you who are succeeding in what you want to do it's just like naturally you start to head that path um i would imagine for yourself you know how can you explain how it's been a little bit like when you're on your dp journey and trying to get on bigger projects and being around certain people that you've met on set and you're like i want to this energy is good or right. I'm learning a lot from this person and then it going that direction. Yeah. That is, that's, ex that's why I started the podcast actually. Mm -hmm. That's like the motivating factors because whenever I'm on set, most of the time I'm usually the young, one of the youngest people on set. And, um, it's interesting because I have such a leadership role on set. And a lot of the people that I hire that are gaffers, key grips, ACs, they're usually 30 years old, 40 years old their husbands, their fathers, um, they've been through life way more than I have. They've been through so many different phases of life. And mm -hmm. those people have really influenced how I've matured as a person, how I look at the balance of life and work. Um, because I, I also come from the mindset of, you know, work, 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 grow, like grind, grind, grind. And I, there is an element to that that is important to have but i also think it's equally as important to find the balance of work 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 stop working and enjoy the present moment with your family and friends and those people that father the gaffer that's 40 years old that has two kids that spend that rushes home from set to go watch his kids baseball game or is on lunch with his kids or uh, is on lunch and facetimes his kids that to me is super eye-opening to the fact that work isn't everything mm -hmm. and trying to find the balance of Make sure the people that are closest to you, that truly support you, know that you are with them and you support them, you love them, and that work doesn't take priority over that. Mm -hmm. So like that is that to me um, are the people that I seek on set, or the people that are a little older than me that have went through these experiences and that have a great balance of work and life and family. That's so huge. How people are outside of work right. and how they view that work-life balance. And it's not a coincidence that some of these people are also some of the most successful because they don't waste time. It's right. like when they are working, they're locked in. Um, there's a lot of people who are workaholics or work too much. They don't have that work-life balance. But, you know, there's a lot of studies been done like in a given day. Let's say you're, you're a freelancer or you work for yourself. Like there's only so many hours you can devote that you're locked in, yeah. focused. It's maybe like four or even three where right. you have that like focus session. If you're just spending 10 hours working all day, neglecting like having that dinner with family or neglecting like playing with your kids if you have kids or doing anything that's in your like not work life, it can totally consume you um, if you're not careful. So I think if you have what you just said and you appreciate who's around you, you're more present ironically like you might get more locked in with work and accomplish more because right. you know that that time that you are on set or that time that you are working is very crucial there isn't any minutes to waste because you want to get off set and be off right. so then you got to be locked in when you are working and it gives you the mental break too of not always thinking about work not thinking about business and mm -hmm. it could open your perspective to new things and i found that I, I would go on vacation now or I would just go to the beach, relax, something that would be really hard for me because I felt like I needed to consistently work. But like being on a vacation or just taking a break for a weekend, when I came back, I feel refreshed. You feel like you can get after it again at 100%. Mm. And I think it's important. You have to almost like think of yourself like a battery. And if you keep training, draining, draining without recharging, you're just, you're dying. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to be... <laughs> I was going to be like, yeah, you don't want to be dead. <laughs> you don't. It's, it's true. <laughs> yeah. I 100% I agree, though. Um, yeah. I want to shift into something that you mentioned uh, two days ago that I thought was a really uh, great point that I never thought of for creators that are working with uh, brands and clients directly is you found something unique, and that is not just putting something on your website to share a project and a video and call it a day. Brands want to see what you could do for them as a whole. Mm. Like what kind of packet, what could you really do for them? And I think after you explaining it to me and seeing your website, you creating this 
um, what was the word you're calling? Case study. Case study yeah. of what this brand got from you and how it's benefiting them, I think is a truly uh, insightful way to look at how you could benefit a brand. Yeah. And honestly, you can take that approach to really any project. Um, so to give a little more explanation on uh, what Carlos talking about, I, I haven't had a website in like four years, which also to my point, to, to, to the point of a website, I don't think it's super crucial. I think everyone gets super caught up in like trying to have the best website, but at least for what I do, it, it was, has never been like a huge, uh, focal point for me as far as getting business, but I did run into a problem constantly. And the problem was I would get these leads and they'd say, Hey, like we really want to work with you. We want to hire you as a, our, um, filmmaker to create this um, spot or create this Facebook ad or social post. Do you have anything that's similar or any reference work that we can look at? And I found myself constantly scrapping together stuff. I'm, I'm looking for like old Vimeo links. Okay. I'm looking for like the YouTube video that's kind of like has a section in there. So I'm right. sending them like the timestamp to YouTube video. To make it look presentable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying yeah. to put it in an email that makes it look all exactly. nice and links are all easy to click. Or I'm sending them my Instagram account. And it got to a point where honestly it was just tedious because mm. I was explaining myself over and over again. And, you know, obviously it's a lead. So some of these leads would not actually, you know, become actual projects. So what I decided to do was, okay, I'm going to redo my website because I'm pushing it off. Um, each client tile that I have. So, you know, everyone's familiar with having a tile with like mm -hmm. a brand logo on it. And then you click on it. And usually, especially like DPs or anyone in the filmmaking space will put the video that they created. Right. And it's just very beautiful and it's aesthetic and it's awesome. It's just the video is just living right there. But what's hard is um, the brand doesn't really know your involvement in that project necessarily. Like you might put like director of photography and like the crew, but it's also insightful for them to see how the brand that you did that for, how it was used and in what capacity. Mm. Because let's say you're doing a TV spot, right? Was it posted on their website at any point? How many like impressions did it get? Um how involved were like the bts images are crucial some of my projects i i put all the bts images because some clients you know it we all know that it doesn't really matter what you shoot on like as long as you have the right crew and right. a good setup but right. some some clients they want to see where their money is working right so if they can see bts of like huge lights the nice camera all these things when you say oh yeah the budget's uh 20 grand they'll be more insightful, like more inclined to believe you and put some money behind it right. because they see the work that went behind it. And so for me now, when it, I have like certain client projects, I take screenshots of how it was used in that capacity for the brand. I have the video so they can watch it. Then in below, I have some BTS images of me on set working. And so now when you click on this page, it's this kind of case study, as we said, shows how this project was used, how... Mm -hmm. Uh, it takes them behind the scenes of what it kind of looked like to bring it to life. But this is the kicker. Now, when brands reach out, hey, do you have any reference work that is similar to this type of project we're trying to achieve? I don't have to scrap together a bunch of random right. links. I could just send them that page on my website for that specific client that I think is a good fit, as like a good reference. And then instead of sending 10 links in an email, I just send one. Like, yeah, I did a project for blank brand. Here's a link. Right. And there's more details about the and project right there. Everything out for them. They, exactly. I'm sure they'll have questions, but mm -hmm. you essentially provide every single thing and spell it out for them. Yeah. What this what this could do for them. And it gives them an, it gives them an opportunity um, to potentially check out your other stuff that's now on your website. Because when you're scrapping together links like a Vimeo link and you're sending references, you're not sending them like all your vimeo links you know i mean the hope is they come to they go click on your profile and they see all the other work but you're not sitting together you can't rely on that no yeah. no you can't rely on that and you're not banking on sending them every fire piece of content you've ever made right. to prove yourself and so having just a very concise page is is huge i think if you're any kind of creative looking to brand yourself in any way what made you come to that conclusion like i know you said that you were just scrapping vimeo links but did it take you a while to just like this is how i should structure this like how did you come up with that particular type of structure um i don't think it's anything new necessarily a lot of people have done it but a lot of agencies will do that right do you look at yourself kind of like an uh, agency or do you have aspirations to become an agency not really 
I, I don't, I thought I did in the past, but I realize I don't work well when I'm managing. I, I'm not, I don't like managing people. Mm. I can do it and I have done it, but I like when I have full kind of autonomy to be able to just do my own thing right. and make decisions quickly. Cause I'm still very much so in a phase where I make drastic changes in business. And if I have team, there's people on payroll and I'm, I'm people are relying on me to like feed their family. It's right. you just, you can't make these quick rash yeah. decisions. Like I sometimes do um, because that means the whole trajectory of the business might change and that can affect everyone underneath mm -hmm. if you have like a full agency. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that there's uh, my, uh, my podcast co-host, Paul, a good buddy of mine, like he talks about the self agency approach, which is like a one man band agency right. where you do put together crew. If you need it, you operate as like an agency, but it's just you, mm. but the project presents itself. You have your go-to people right. and you put together a crew of 15 people and you pull it off. Mm. And I like that approach. I think it gives people the freedom to do what they want. Mm. Um, it's a good connect because you can bring them business when they want it. Uh, but I, I've never had aspiration to become an agency necessarily, but a lot of agencies take that approach where you go to their website and it's, they have a part like yeah. special digital marketing mm -hmm. agencies if they run ads and stuff you go there and they say testimonials or case studies and you click on the case study and it's like how we helped uh this brand achieve this many impressions this is the back end this is the metrics this is how we did it right. it's super insightful for any brand that wants to work with this agency now because they can fit themselves in that mold They're like i that could be us we could have that similar success that what you just said, I think is super important is having a brand be able to see themselves yep. in an example. That's huge. Mm -hmm. I got two questions for you left. Yep. All right. Okay, let's do it. The last, the second one, first one is uh, more so for people that are listening that fear starting something, fear mm -hmm. trying something new, or, or don't think that their voice has any worth to share on YouTube or filmmaking or graphic design art, whatever it is. And I, I talk to people about this a lot and it, it makes me sad sometimes when I hear that they, they just don't feel that they have anything to say, mm. but everyone does. Like, what advice do you have to somebody that feels that their voice isn't worth being told or heard? Mm -hmm. It's a deep question. <laughs> it kind of is. I'm yeah. like, my gears turning a bit. I think for me and advice that I would have for anyone who has the fear to start, um, honestly, maybe contrary to what a lot of people might say is understanding that sometimes you don't need to show up online. We kind of talked a little bit on the mic. I think in the past, I've always kind of been that friend in the friend circle saying, man, you should start a YouTube channel. Like, it'd be so cool Like we could do this together. Or why aren't you posting online? Like, why don't you post more reels? Like, why don't you post more, sto more stories? I was always that more motivational friend trying to get all my friends to be creative like me and yeah, yeah, yeah. do that. But as I become more matured in, in life in general, I'm realizing that not everyone wants that. Mm. You know, not everyone cares to be online. Some people just don't care to be like a YouTuber or show up in stories. Like, it's exhausting for some people. Some We feel creatively fueled by it. But some people just honestly have the monetary pressure to do it because they feel like they're missing out on financial gain by not showing up online. So if you're definitely, if you're listening to this and you're of the camp, like, dang, you know what? I do actually hate that. Like, I don't like talking on a mic. I just do it because I feel like I want to potentially get brand deals and have right. more work, blah, blah, blah. I feel like that's more of a, you need to ask yourself like some more deep self-reflective questions. Like, do you really want to do this? Or is it because there is some sort of monetary gain at the end of the road, which is not a bad motivator. Like, it's okay to do that. I mean, a lot of us start that way. So that's the first part. But now if you're of the camp where you do actually want to do it, you do enjoy talking on the mic, but you feel like there's just no value to be had or you just mm -hmm. have that imposter syndrome of, man, I don't know if it'll succeed. I don't know if anybody will care what I have to say. The best thing that um, I have done and the advice that I've gotten is understand that in the beginning, it's going to be rough. Anyone who tells you that it's not is lying because they're just either archived all their old videos or like haven't shown you the growth process. Um, like even a, uh, a good buddy of ours, Ryan Cow, like he's on this trip. Mm -hmm. I only found out on this trip that he's had like six abandoned YouTube channels. Like you would come to his channel and be like, this dude has it figured out that this is fire. 
but he's had multiple YouTube channels that he's tried to start, failed, realized it wasn't for him, that wasn't his niche, and I'm sure there was a lot of imposter syndrome along the way each time he decided to abandon a channel, but then he finally found the one that stuck. Right. And it's the same with anybody's journey. There's going to always be a very rough learning curve in the beginning, and then it just grows exponentially, and you have to trust that process. And if you're at a point where you feel like there, there isn't anything to share quite yet, just stick it out, be true to who you are and realize that there will come a point where it takes off. And if you haven't felt that takeoff yet, you you just got to keep putting in your daily deposits, mm -hmm. daily deposits. It's like the gym. You know what I mean? If you, you can't expect to like say, I'm going to work out for six months and become freaking shredded. Right. It doesn't really work that right. way because anybody who knows who's actually into fitness understands that years and uh, they understand that this is a life thing. Mm -hmm. You don't just work out, get in the best shape of your life for, you know, five years and then fall off and never work out again after five years. Like you might take, like let off the gas a bit, same thing with like anything successful. Like you can kind of take a back seat after it gets to a certain point and you can just maintain, but there's definitely a period there where you need to grind and then understand that there, it's not an overnight thing. Right. It happens very subtly before you even know it. And your question from earlier, I feel like I'm still a work in progress and it's mm -hmm. been years. Yeah. You feel that way. A lot of people feel that way. And once you accept that, it's a lot less, it gives you a lot less anxiety to yeah. show up and it gives you a lot. It's not as nerve wracking right. because everyone's going to have a rough learning curve. It's letting go of the feel of fear of failure. Yeah. yeah. And it's just always being a, a constant student. I have a part B to that point though, which is, you also just still at the same time need to be um, trying to put out your best work. Yes. That's not always obvious for people though. I've seen some people who say, you know what? I'm just going to let go, be myself. But the thing is they go on this like huge stretch of just posting trash stuff that they know is not their best work. And I'm not really of that camp. Like mm -hmm. you still need to look at a piece of work that you do and when you hit that upload button or you just have high standards. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and don't let, don't let that go. Right. Because you're trying to, oh, it's going to be rough in the beginning. Like, of course there's a measure of mm. not being so perfect, a perfectionist on yourself, but don't just put out stuff for the sake of putting out stuff. Look at it and be like, is this the best version of myself that I could be right now? Yes. Upload. Mm. Yes. Upload. But I feel like some people will just forget that and, right oh, I'm just going to get my reps in and just put out a bunch of stuff. And you have to be careful with the stuff that you put online. Sometimes you don't know who's going to see it. Mm -hmm. And it will, once you put something online, it will live there forever. No matter if you archive it, unlist it, whatever, anything you upload to the digital world will stay Same. there in some form. So just always something to keep in mind. All right, great answer. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate that answer a lot. Yeah, that's a good question. No. Um, last question. Yeah. This is my go-to last question. It's, uh, you know, you're sitting across the table from that 10 year ago version of you when you first picked up the camera or you first started your YouTube channel and you don't know who you are yet. You haven't found your voice, but that version of you is sitting across from your current self right now. What advice would you give that version of you 10 years ago? Damn, that's a deep question, bro. Right. <laughs> that's super deep. I like that question a lot. It's my favorite. Yeah. Wow. <sighs> Just thinking a little bit. For me, one thing that I've always thought about from when I was just a little bit younger, if I were to have this conversation with like a younger version of myself, I would tell him to document more. Mm -hmm. um, because in the early stages of being a creative, you're so focused on where you want to go. You're so focused on people who are crushing it that you often don't look at your own life through the same lens. Mm -hmm. You think like, oh, there's nothing meaningful to share here. I'm not at that level yet. Or uh, no one's going to care what I have to say. Kind of what we were just talking about. But man, I look back on some of my low points and high points. And if I had in some shape or form documented that process, it'd be so priceless. And that's the thing about life is unless you document those points in your life, you can't go back and like relive those moments. Um, it's like a, it's like photos. That's why photos are so awesome because 
if you don't take that photo in that moment, even though it's like, oh, it's whatever, it's a whatever moment, those whatever moments, you'll look back in 20 years and be like, dang, those were some crazy memories that we made, yeah. you know? And I think if I would tell myself anything, it's document more of your life and show more of your process and like be okay with that. Yeah. Because if I could look back on my life and if I had documented more things, one, I would feel more fulfilled, like seeing seeing more of how I got here. But two, it, it paints a better picture for people. Because when you don't document, you are just really to yourself and you don't share anything. And this is with if you want to show up online. Right, right. People only see you at the top. Yeah. And they won't get to like l- see that experience you went right. through. And they'll always just hold you to this high standard right. that you, you haven't always held yourself to that it's high like standard. A lack of relatability. Yeah, yeah. Because some of my favorite people, not even in the social media space in general, are people that I can relate to. Right. And those same people are the ones that have done a good job at painting a picture of where they came from to who they are. And I think that's something that I would tell my younger self. So now I'm always trying to do that through experiences, do that through shooting with cameras. Like, how can I show more of this, uh, document more of this life that I'm living? Mm -hmm. And even with my wife, like we talk about this when we're traveling. And when I was younger, my parents used to have these photo albums of me and my brother mm. and like old video. My dad used to have like the huge video on his right. video camera on his shoulder and he would get everything. And th- some of the best times my family are reflecting on those things, those, those like physical photos and whatnot. And we become so like consumed in the digital space. It's so like hyper stimulating right now with all the stuff, all the tools we have available that it's really hard to uh, get back into that mindset of just documenting so we can look back and reflect on this like piece of time that we can never get back. So it's a little bit deeper and not really business related, but that's something that I would definitely tell my younger self to do. All right. That's a great answer. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I love that question. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, everyone usually takes like a pause before they answer it. Yeah. It, it takes, it takes people a minute sometimes, but, um, yeah. Where can people find you? What's your, yeah. Info? Um, Edward Lee films, super basic, uh, that's okay. Simple's good. <laughs> yeah, Edward Lee. So that's Edward L E E Films. Pretty much everywhere on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, like right. all these platforms we have now. Yeah. <laughs> so many. Uh, Edward Lee Films, and then also, I also have own, my own podcast. That's right. Um, with my co-host Paul, a good buddy of mine. We it's for creatives as well. It's called Mid Combo. Uh, you can Check find it, it everywhere. We're gonna have Carlo on. So. By the time you listen to this, we'll probably have an episode with Carlo on Mid Convo as well. So I talked a lot today, but if you want to hear more about Carlo... I'll be talking more tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. And if you came here, if you're on this podcast to hear more of Carlo, go check out Mid Convo because I know Carlo has a lot of stories and a lot of good experiences to share too. So thank you for coming on, man. Um, So yeah, hopefully you enjoyed today's episode. I will see you next time. Peace out. Sweet. Thanks, everyone. Musicbed has been my favorite resource for finding music for all of my videos, and now with my podcast, it has been my favorite place to find my intro and outro music. With over 40,000 curated songs available for licensing for any podcast, the music that they have on their roster will help elevate your story and whatever you're trying to share on your podcast. Finding music is also extremely easy with their browse and search tools. Use anything from genre mood to advanced filters like BPM and key. Playlists from your favorite creatives are also an amazing tool. Some of my favorite playlists include chill, hip-hop, ambient, cinematic. These are just a few examples of some of the playlists that you can find. And if you still need help finding what you need, Musicbed's team can help you with their complimentary song searches. Hear the difference for yourself and sign up for a free account. Use the code CARLO at checkout and receive one month free when you purchase a podcast subscription. Thank you, Musicbed. So that's a wrap on today's episode. Hopefully you enjoyed the conversation with our guest. And as I mentioned in the intro, if you enjoy the podcast, you enjoyed today's episode, leave a rating on whatever podcast platform you're using, share it with a friend, share and tag us on Instagram at Creative Gap. Let us know your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. So I'm going to leave you with some nice calming music to wrap up today's episode. Enjoy the rest of your week. I will see you next time. Peace out.